Oh, Father, this confidence that we who believe have, we have it only because you made it possible for us to have it. Thank you for that great cost to yourself, making it possible for us to draw near to you with confidence in prayer, to draw near to you in, with confidence in all of life. Lord, we do not deserve this richness that is ours in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you, you are a generous God. You overwhelm us every day with what you provide. The best that you have provided is your son. Lord Jesus, we love you. And we thank you for dying for us, for being raised from the dead, for sitting at the right hand of your Father. We thank you and we are eager for your appearing. Come, Lord Jesus. And in the meantime, align us more and more with your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. And we will try one more time to put a Bible in your hand. This time we actually will let people with Bibles come down the aisles and put one in your hand. If you need a Bible, just put your hand up and we'll make sure that you get one. So sorry about that. That was our bad. And let's turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 this morning. We've been out of Romans for, I don't know, a couple weeks it seems. And we need to get back into the groove of how Romans 1 ended and how Roman 2, Romans 2 begins. And overall, in Paul's letter here, just to remind you of the bigger picture, the, Paul aims to unfold the richness and the depth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what this letter is about. And his desire in doing so is to solidly establish the church in Rome in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has a further aim even beyond that. It's that the church in Rome would become his next sending church towards the west. He is aiming to go to Spain, we find out in Romans chapter 15. So before that can occur with all of its maximum benefit, the church must not just understand the gospel that Paul preaches. They can't just check off an okay on the, that gospel, they must actually be thoroughly established in this gospel. So Paul begins with something of a small enticement of the richness of that gospel, the depth of that gospel. If you look at chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek he explains even more, for in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous by faith shall live. Paul gives us a glimpse into the richness and the depths of the gospel. He's so kind to do that, to just give us a, a short little look at it because he then walks us over to the edge. And he invites us to look down. And the rest of Romans chapter 1 from verse 18 to the end is Paul helping us peer over the edge down into the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath right now because that is where mankind is by choice and by God's just wrath. Man is in such a deplorable condition there under God's wrath that he does not desire in himself to be out at all to get out from under it. Nor could he in his own strength get out, even if he wanted to. He is that far gone. Every man is under the wrath of God, and every man there is worthy of the death of judgment, and he knows it. Look at chapter 1, verse 32. This is how the chapter ended. And although they know the ordinance of God, what do you mean? That those who practice such unrighteous things that are above this, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. There is mankind for you, described in chapter one. And then if you remember, we've started in Romans chapter two, and we've covered verses one to five so far, and we see something of a surprise, a 
a strange surprise, actually a disturbing surprise. Paul introduces us to a man who believes that he somehow has climbed to higher moral ground in that abyss of God's wrath. And he's no different than the rest. He practices the same unrighteousness that they all commit, but he doesn't stand in approval of the rest, like is said in verse 32 of chapter 1, but rather he stands in judgment of the rest. So he is a moralist of sorts in his own making. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. This moralist primary hope in judging, other is, in judging others is that he somehow believes in doing so, that he will make himself exempt from the coming wrath of God. Look at verse 3. Paul says, do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same, do you suppose that you will escape the judgment of God? This is insane thinking. It's as insane as a convicted murderer on death row judging the others on death row with hopes that his sentence will not be carried out because he agrees with the law about how bad all the others are. But he can't even see his own hypocrisy. So he's not just a moralist, he's a, he's a hypocritical moralist. And this hypocritical moralist, although he has no desire to be judged by God, who does? He yet has no desire to repent and change. Look at verse 4. Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. This poor soul has not grasped that by his hypocritical, moralistic judging of others, he's only making the day of wrath even more intolerable for himself. Verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And so Paul aims to shock this man with the truth about God's judgment on him. He's not escaping it at all. It's actually on him so that he might abandon his false sense of escaping judgment. And so let me just review with you the outline. Here's what we've how we've kind of packaged this and try to think about this. There are four shocking facts in 2, 1, 2, 11 about this hypocritical moralist that destroys his false sense of escaping judgment. He has, number one, inexcusable behavior before the judgment of God. He practices the very same things, and yet he is judging others who do the very same things he does. And then in verses 2 to 4, there, we find that there's insupportable thinking behind the behavior. In verse 2, you have a knowledge word, we know. In verse 3, you have a, another knowledge word, do you suppose this? Verse 4, there's another knowledge word, do you think lightly of the riches? Verse 4, another knowledge or thinking word, not knowing. You see, there's insupportable thinking behind his inexcusable behavior. And all of that leads to the third fact. In verse 5, he has insurmountable wrath at the judgment of God. And there is yet one more shocking fact about this hypocritical moralist that will destroy his false sense of escape from judgment. Number four, he has an indisputable standard from the God of judgment. An indisputable standard from the God of judgment. He has to face that. God will judge him in such a way with such a standard that the hypocritical moralist will not be able to escape. Let me read verses 6 to 11. This God with righteous judgment, verse 5, is the God who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, 
wrath, and indignation. Tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now I want you to notice also what Paul has done here in introducing this hypocritical moralist to us. Ten times in the first five verses are words like judgment, condemning, and wrath. Ten times in five verses. What Paul is really doing here in Romans at this point is using this hypocritical moralist to teach us about God's judgment, to teach us the place that God's righteous judgment holds in the unfolding of the gospel account in Romans. And so it is very important for us to understand this morning and even next week, it's important for us to continually remind ourselves that this is a judgment context. It's a judgment context. It's telling us about how God judges. Paul's trying to teach us about the judgment that is rightly executed by God toward every man. And and you may be tempted at points today and, and even next week to drag thoughts about, well, wait a minute, that's not the way God saves. And you have to remind yourself, this is not about how God saves. It is about how God, what? Judges. And there is a difference. And there is a relation but there is a difference. So we're going to need to work hard together to simply be patient as we go through this passage and be humble and let these words say what these words say. And then we can clarify more at the end. So this is about how God judges all men. It is not about how God saves some who believe. Upon mentioning the revelation of the righteous judgment of God in verse 5, Paul unleashes this long relative clause that tells us more about who this God of righteous judgment is and how he judges. He is indisputable as the righteous judge. First notice with me this morning, number one, the individually focused God of judgment in verse 6. He is the God who will render to each person according to his deeds. Now, this hypocritical moralist, he's raised himself up to judge. He actually needs to meet the judge, and that's what happens here. It's important for us to notice that God, in his judgment, will single out each man, each person, one by one, by the next one, they will come and face him. He's individually focused. He does not judge collectively, all at once, but it is a a one-at-a-time, face-to-face judgment. And the evidence that God will examine in each person is the deeds done by each. God is looking at the deeds or the works that each person has done. He is the God who will render to each person according to to his deeds. The issue on that great and fearful day of judgment will be what your life reveals in deeds. This is one of the most basic and foundational principles of God's judgment to understand. On his day of judgment, God will judge each of us on the basis of deeds we have done. We remind ourselves again here, this is a context on how God judges each person, not on how he saves some. How he judges is not how he saves. Certainly there's a relationship between them, but a day of judgment is coming. This says when God will individually focus on me and on you. And what we have done or what we have not done will be the issue that he focuses on. Paul expands on exactly what that judgment of God will look like in verses seven to 10. So notice with me secondly, number two, the entirely separated groups at judgment. Paul tells us there are two and only two classes of people at the judgment of God. 
It was helpful to think about that in 1 John 5 this morning as Wayman led us um, in communion, and to think that there are two and only two classes of people. Each of them has primary characteristics that sum each of them up, and they are night and day the opposite of one another, and both have an entirely different outcome from the other. They are entirely separated groups, as you'll see. So I don't wanna, what I want to do is take you through each group one at a time, and so we'll start with the blessed group in chapter 2, verse 7, and then verse 10 comes back around and deals with this group again. And the way Paul does this, treats these two groups, is it's, it's a poetic form. It's, he starts with the blessed, and then he goes to the cursed, and then he goes backwards. He says more about the cursed, and then he finishes back with the blessed. It's a, it's a chiasm if you're interested. And if not, just never mind, let's keep going. The blessed group. How are these characterized at judgment? Well, let's start with what they do. Look at verse 7. To those who by perseverance in doing good. And what I want you to think about as we go through this is who might these people be? What kind of person might this be? Who on the day of God's judgment will be found to have been characterized in their life by doing good? And then notice secondly about this group, how they do good. Look at verse 7. To those who by perseverance in doing good. They persevere in doing good. These, Paul says, that they have the ability to endure or to remain under the doing of those good deeds. Well, who would be like that in life? Even all the way up until the point of judgment. Who, even though they are harassed by temptations and even though they face discouragements in the face of doing good, who persevere anyway? And they keep fighting to do good. And notice what they seek. Verse 7, they seek for glory and honor and immortality. These individuals in this group are, are after something weighty. That's what the idea of glory is. That they're after something weighty, something impressive, something glorious, something full of splendor. And their affections are running toward a kind of honor, a kind of dignity, a respectableness. And they've got their eyes set on gaining what is immortal, immortality, an incorruptible condition. Just for a moment, turn back to um, Romans chapter 1, verse 23. In describing mankind, professing to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God, an immortal God, for an image of the form of corruptible man and of birds and other creatures. They don't want what is immortal. They don't want what is incorruptible, mankind. They don't want what is, cor but they want instead what is corruptible. But these, at judgment, appear to have gone through some kind of a change where what they want to pursue is that which is incorruptible immortal. Well, who would that be? And, and see what they receive, verse 7. God will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will render to them eternal life. Not just eternal in the sense of quantity of life, that it has no end in sight, that is certainly true, but eternal in the sense of who it came from. We have life in his son, we've heard even earlier. It's eternal in the sense of quality, too. It is the very life lived in the presence of an eternal God, the eternal God. Individuals in this group will receive this very eternal life of God in all of its fullness on that day of judgment, even though we possess it as a down payment now. They will know the glory they will know the honor. They will know the immortality that only the eternal God can give in eternal life. Well, who would be this? Who would be rewarded such like this? And if you notice, Paul doesn't say. And so for now, we're going to keep moving. He leads us to the next group in verse 8. We'll call them the cursed group. Now, how are these characterized at judgment? Let's begin in verse 8 with what they seek. 
But in contrast, he will render to those who are selfishly ambitious. What do they seek? They seek themselves. They are self-seeking. They're controlled by selfish ambition. They're infatuated with themselves. They are engrossed with self. These are characterized by seeking whatever pleases themselves, whatever serves self. Well, who would that be at judgment? And notice then what they don't do, verse 8. Those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth. They do not obey the truth. Their pursuit of self actually gets in the way of obedience to truth. And contextually, what would this truth be? It would be the truth of God in chapter 1 that God reveals concerning himself through creation and then even more in his word. And have you ever made this connection in your life? If not, you need to. That the pursuit of self will never lead you to obedience to truth, to God's word. Notice what they do next. They obey unrighteousness. You see, this is what the pursuit of self does. It promotes allegiance to or obedience to all that is not right in God's eyes, to what is unrighteousness. These, in this group, prefer to be in bondage to or in obedience to unrighteousness, and they don't want to be in allegiance to the truth of God. Who would these be? Doesn't this sound like Romans 1.18? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They're not obeying this truth because they're suppressing it, and they're driven by unrighteousness. They're obeying unrighteousness. And let's look at verse 9 on what they receive. Or I'm sorry, the end of verse 8 yet. What they receive, wrath and indignation. That's as opposed to eternal life. So the God, God will render to each person according to his deeds, verse 6, um, and he, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, he will render to them wrath and indignation. The word wrath means God's settled, determined, unwavering, unchanging, his steady anger, righteous anger. And the word indignation is, is a more explosive idea. It is God's hot and righteous outburst of righteous anger. It's not an unrighteous outburst of anger like we're capable of and do, but rather it is a righteous outburst of a boiling up and over of righteous anger. These have reached the end of God's kindness. Do you remember this in chapter 2, verse 4? They have reached the end of God's tolerance. That idea of the word tolerance was that God was bearing up and away from them the wrath that he was dispensing towards them. He's holding it back, the, the wrath that they're storing up for themselves. These, on judgment day, have run out of God's kindness and his tolerance. He is no longer patient, and the wrath that they have stored up for themselves in verse 5 will burst forth down on them like when a dam breaks up high on high ground and releases its unavoidable tidal wave on poor souls downstream. God is angry with these, righteously so. This group's recompense is condemnation. They get God's hot displeasure. Who would that be? Now examine next with me now verse 9, what they experience. Tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. Tribulation, it's a, it's a word that means a pressing in until the breaking point. It's, it's used to refer to such anguish of life that is overwhelming. And the word distress means being cramped or surrounded. It's used for extreme affliction, severe confinement. And this is experienced at the soul level of the man, verse 9. Tribulation and the distress for every soul. And you see individually focused here. So this is not a superficial, external-based affliction, but the soul is under torment. God is the judge. 
who will be the one who collapses down on them. He will press in on them when he pours out on them the wrath that he himself has been bearing up and tolerating in his kindness and in his patience from them with the hopes that they would repent and turn from their sin. He will finally let it go and he, the God of our righteous judgment, will collapse on them. And they will feel the anguish of soul that he has against them in his hot displeasure. Who would this be? There's one more to add with the what they do. So we'll add to that in verse 9. For every soul of man who does evil. So we'll put that back up with the ones who obey unrighteousness. And this is what self-seeking truly is. It's evil. This is what disobeying truth is. It's doing evil. This is what obeying unrighteousness is. It's, it's evil. Whoever these are, at a minimum, they are evil doers in life. But notice Paul introduces us to a distinction between mankind, <clears throat> a distinction that he is not making. Um, verse 9, this will be for every soul of man, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. It, it's a point of clarification for Paul. It's as if there's been in somebody's thought somewhere or this, is, this false distinction has been already introduced between men at judgment, and Paul wants to knock this down. All of them, all, every soul of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But why did Paul need to make it clear that at judgment, God isn't dividing mankind on the basis of Jews over here and non-Jews over here, or Greeks or Gentiles? Who would think that way? And thus, we are learning a little bit more about who the hypocritical moralist is and where he's from. Perhaps he has thought that at judgment, the Jews will escape, but not the Greeks. But what Paul has made clear about the righteous judgment of God here is that on the day of judgment, if you've been known for self-seeking in your life, if you've been known for being disobedient to his truth, if in your life you've been actually obedient to unrighteousness, if in your life you have done evil, God won't care if you are a Jew or a Greek, or for that matter, he won't care if you're American. He won't care if you're female or male. He won't care if you're young or if you're old. He won't care what color your skin is. Wrath and indignation, along with the tribulation and distress, will be given to you according to the evil deeds you've done. God doesn't divide man into these two groups anyway except on the basis of their deeds. And then Paul in verse 10 takes us back to the blessed group. So let's add to this what they experience. Verse 10, what do they experience? Glory and honor and peace. At judgment, those in this group will experience uh, what they pursued in verse 7. They, they will experience the weighty, radiant splendor that they were seeking for. They will experience the honor and the dignity that they were seeking for. But notice Paul doesn't say immortality again. He says peace. Why did he switch to peace? I think it's because to be in contrast to what the cursed group experienced from God. They experienced tribulation and distress. But don't worry, blessed group, you get peace. Peace with God. Peace with God at judgment. They meet the God of righteous judgment, and instead of experiencing tribulation and distress and anguish, they get peace. And then Paul just restates the same. What they do, verse 10, they do good. So there's nothing more to add. We already have that from verse 7. And notice that Paul mentions again at the end of verse 10 that false distinction again to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If the hypocritical moralist thinks that God will divide mankind at judgment by nationality, by heritage, by Jew and non-Jew, he's going to find out that God doesn't divide mankind on that basis at all. God divides humanity into two entirely separate groups according to 
what they have done. And if you've been marked in life by doing good, it will not matter in the righteous judge eyes if you are Jew or Gentile, male or female, young or old. It doesn't matter what color or skin you have. Glory and honor and peace with God will be your experience with the judge of all mankind. He is the individually focused God. And notice lastly, number three, the strictly unbiased God of judgment. Verse 11, for there is no partiality with God. Paul is saying God doesn't play favorites at all on the basis of a person being a Jew or a Gentile, male or female, young, old. He doesn't play favorites on the basis of skin color. Now certainly, with God, a Jew had privilege and a Jew had priority with God. But that does not mean that God will show partiality to a Jew or play favorites with a Jew. As the righteous judge, he simply doesn't measure at judgment by those distinctions. He can't be bought. He can't be biased towards you because of anything like that. His standard for judgment is indisputable. It is consistent. This individually focused, strictly unbiased God is supremely righteous. That means in judgment, he always is on the side of what is good and what is right. What he affirms is right. And what he negates is evil. And he is the final determiner. And this individually focused, strictly unbiased God has unlimited knowledge. That means in judgment, he perceives with unerring accuracy every right and every wrong. He perfectly sifts each one of us. He is the expert winnower of good and evil. There is nothing hid from his sight. And this individually focused, strictly unbiased God possesses ultimate authority. That means his jurisdiction knows no bounds. You cannot defect from his realm and seek asylum in an embassy somewhere where he can't touch you. His authority is absolute because he is God. He is the very standard of justice and equity everywhere. And this individually focused, strictly unbiased God has unrestricted power at judgment. That means he has the power to execute the sentence that his righteousness calls for. He has the power to condemn for hell, uh, forever in hell. And he has the power to reward in heaven forever. But there's one more amazing attribute for this individually focused, strictly unbiased God who judges. He has unfathomable love. Unfathomable love. In love, he gave his own son into his righteous judgment at the cross. And his son, in love, agreed and willingly went to die as a substitute in the place of those who could never withstand God's righteous judgment on their own. And so there at the cross, this God of love individually focused on his son as if he was unrighteous, as if he was the one who did evil, as if he was the one who was selfishly ambitious, as if he was disobedient to truth and obedient to unrighteousness. And there, God collapsed on his son in wrath and in judgment and poured out his wrath and indignation. And Jesus, on the cross, somehow suffered that great tribulation and distress of soul described in Romans 2. Not because he sinned, but because God made him the substitute. God made him who knew no sin 
to be sin on the cross so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And now we need to connect how God saves some with how God judges everyone. You see, the call in the gospel of Jesus Christ is to believe that Jesus indeed suffered somehow on that day 2,000 years ago just outside the city of Jerusalem, that somehow he, he suffered the wrath of God and the tribulation and his indignation and distress of soul that you deserve. And by believing Christ, God will declare over your life a status of righteousness that you, as an unrighteous sinner, could never achieve on your own. And you are given it solely on the basis of grace alone through faith alone. This is the gospel that is the power for salvation to everyone who believes. This is how God saves those who believe. But in verses 8 and 9, the group described there, who are they? They are made up of those who do not believe. They do not believe Jesus. They are those who reject the gospel. And because in life they refused to believe God, their disbelief can only produce in them evil deeds and disobedience. And that one will be judged on the basis of those deeds. But because there's no pardon in Christ for them, that one will be recompensed only with what his deeds deserve, wrath and indignation from God. And he will suffer tribulation and distress of soul for eternity in hell. Therefore, the unbeliever's judgment spoken of here is a judgment unto eternal condemnation away from Christ in hell as God for eternity collapses his wrath and indignation upon him. This is the one who is in the cursed group of Romans 2, 8 and 9. Your only hope when God judges every man on the basis of his deeds is this gospel that is offered to you today. Your only hope on that day, at judgment, is the salvation God offers today. For those who believe, think on this. They are saved solely on the basis of grace alone through faith alone. At salvation, God is not looking for any good deeds to be done by the one who believes. No good deeds could be done by the believer to provoke God to credit his son's work at the cross to the believer's account. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of work so that no one would boast. Salvation is not on the basis of works. Judgment is on the basis of works. And God tells us that by grace, the believer in Jesus Christ is then transformed, made into a new creature. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old way of living without Christ and as a slave to sin has passed away, and behold, a new life of slavery to God has come. In fact, let's turn over to Titus chapter 2. Let's remind ourselves of what we already know to be true when we studied this not long ago. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. God's word tells us that this one who is transformed is one who is even zealous right now for good works. Look at verse 14. Jesus Christ is the one who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. That is great news, a judgment. And he gave himself for us to purify for himself a people for his own possession, a people who are zealous for good deeds. That one that God saves through his son's death is transformed and is characterized now in life by one who does good works. 
those good works come out of and from the saving faith. You remember Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. They're good works that he prepared for us beforehand. God is the one who prepared good works for us to live out. We become zealous for good works. Our life becomes, as believers in Jesus Christ, caricaturized by good works. And all of the misdeeds that as believers you and I commit, all of our disobediences at judgment, we're already forgiven by Christ. He redeemed us from every lawless deed. So at the righteous judgment of God, when the believer faces that God, the believer in Jesus Christ can not lose when God gives to everyone according to what they have done. The believer can only gain reward at judgment. That believer is richly rewarded at judgment. So for the believer, judgment is a judgment unto rewards, not a judgment unto condemnation. And this is the blessed man in verse 7 and verse 10 of Romans chapter 2. Now let me take you to just a few more passages to round this out a little bit more. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 14. Turn there with me to verse 10. Romans 14, verse 10. Paul is writing in chapter 14 about how the church of believers need to accept one another. They need to accept the one who is weak in faith and they need not to pass judgment on the one who has made choices in life out of weakness of faith. And he says in verse 10, but you, why do you judge your brother? One believer, why are you judging the other believer? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? Simply because of the choices he's made in life. And here's why. He's asking the question. Because we all will stand before the judgment seat of God. That's all of us believers will stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us who believe, we will give an account of himself to God. There's a moment coming for us when we will be before the judgment seat of Christ. And he will look at what we've done as believers. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Some of Paul's most encouraging words and sobering words. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 6. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord... For we walk by faith while we're in this body, and we don't walk by sight, but when we are with the Lord, we'll walk by sight. Knowing this, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. That should be the goal of every believer, the the highest desire of each one of us who believe Christ. We'd rather leave this body and go be with him. Therefore, verse 9, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. This is, we've been changed. We've been transformed. We are zealous for good works. He prepared for us good works to walk in. Our desires and our affections have been transformed, and we want to be pleasing to him. Why? Verse 10, for we must all, we all believers, he's only been talking about believers, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us, the believers, may be recompensed for what? His deeds done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Every lawless deed forgiven. Go to 1 Corinthians 3 and we'll finish out understanding, at least for now, the judgment that the believer must face. 
It's a very unique judgment. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. Now, Paul is talking about how he built as a master worker. Uh, he laid the foundation for the building or, the, or for the body of Christ in Corinth. And he says in verse 10, according to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation in preaching the gospel to the church in Corinth. And now that I'm gone, another person has come and is starting to build on what we established in the gospel. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. So Paul then is going to talk about the judgment seat again. But he's going to talk about it in terms of like church workers, pastors. But the principle applies to all of us. Look what he says in verse 11. No man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if a man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, remains after the fire of the purifying judgment, that one what? Receives a reward. Verse 15, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Loss of what? Reward. But he himself will be saved. And we know that, right? Every lawless deed we have been redeemed from, yet saved through the fire of judgment. There is a judgment for us as believers. Why, though, would anybody not want to be a believer? Everybody has to face the judgment of God in Christ. Why would anyone not want to believe? Why would anybody not want to repent? Why would anyone not want to be saved by Jesus and therefore be able to face the God of judgment? Let's circle back around to the hypocritical moralist. He didn't want to repent. Do you remember? He didn't want to repent. He didn't want God's salvation. Chapter 2, verse 4 of Romans. He didn't want to change. He wanted to still practice the unrighteousness. He just wanted God to change. He wanted God to change the way that God judges. He wanted God to look the other way so that he could escape judgment. Just God won't do that. And I don't know, may, has that been the thought in your mind? That you really don't want to change, but you're just maybe holding out that maybe God will change at judgment. Maybe, maybe he'll change his mind. You don't like the idea of the righteous judgment of God according to the deeds you've done, but, but you don't want to change. You, you just want God to change the way that he'll judge you. Listen, your only hope when you face how God judges everyone is to believe how God saves some, many. <laughs> in love, he has worked in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that sinful men and women can survive and even thrive at the judgment of God. And he did so not by changing his standard of judgment, but by providing salvation in Jesus. Redeemed from every lawless deed so that you have nothing to fear on that day. And made zealous for good works so that when you stand before him and he evaluates you on the basis of your deeds, he recognizes his very workmanship in your life, the good deeds that he made for you, and you are rewarded richly. God's judgment standard hasn't changed. But sinners can be savingly changed so as to be rewarded at God's judgment instead of being condemned. This tells you how confident God is in his gospel of his son. He didn't change his standard of judgment but he provided his son as a substitute to die in the place of all who would believe in him 
so that they would have nothing to fear when that judgment comes. He is that confident that you can say things like in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 or in Romans 2 verse 7 that, that we can seek for glory and honor and immortality, that he will reward to us eternal life that we would experience glory and honor and peace with him. Listen, the God of righteous judgment is confident in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Put your confidence in Jesus Christ crucified. Do it today. You may not have another day. And if this day slips past, you will not be ready for that day of judgment. So turn to Christ. If you trust in him and in him alone, if you'll turn away from your self-seeking life, he will not cast you out. But he will pardon you fully. And in this life, you will change. Good deeds, you will become zealous for. And at judgment, you will have no condemnation. But instead, he will sustain you all through life with good deeds all the way to the end and reward you richly with what he gave for you to do. How God judges is not how God saves, but how God saves makes every difference when he judges. Let's pray. Father above, thank you for sending your son. What else can we say as believers? Thank you. Father, help us even in a judgment context like Romans 2. Help us to thank you for helping us see how important good works are. Lord, we, we know that good works don't earn us status with you here. They don't provoke you to save us. We know that. Oh, but Lord, would you grow in us a desire to be pleasing to you? Thank you for redeeming us from every lawless deed, past, present, and future. Thank you that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We know this to be true. Make us eager and humbled and even fearful because of the purifying fire of the judgment seat of Christ. Lord, make us even eager just to be pleasing so that one day we might hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Well done, you judge on the basis of what we do. Oh, Father, thank you for saving us on the basis of Christ's death, which prepares us for that judgment and changes that judgment for us who believe into a judgment unto rewards. We rest in you, we rest in you alone. In Christ's name.